All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Hullabar. I'm the Assistant Director of Championships and Golf Operations for the VSGA. Um, and uh, assisting me is Tim Murphy. He's our Manager of Championships and Golf Operations. Uh, we had a great uh, webinar at noon today with some awesome questions. Um, if you were tuned in last week, um, I will say that we've got maybe close to twice the number of slides and material to go over, but it's going to be uh, pretty solid um, with relief procedures, uh, penalty relief, and uh, hopefully some things that you all can definitely uh, take out of this. So if I move a little quickly, uh, don't be discouraged, answer or throw some questions out in the, the Q&A section. Tim's gonna monitor that for us. We're gonna hit a number of question slides where we'll review some things if you have something to to ask. We will also be uh, hanging around for five or 10 minutes after the presentation to help answer any questions that we didn't get to, or we'll we'll shoot an email out to you uh, tomorrow sometime. So let's go ahead and uh, get started. This is the, uh, the different topics that we're going to talk about. We're gonna start out with uh, some free relief. Quickly going down to the pictures, kind of some real life scenarios here, some areas that you will probably be encountering either already this season um, or will eventually at, at some point. Uh, the picture on the left is a burrowing animal hole and uh, this abnormal course condition actually also includes the track that the animal makes into the hole. Uh, next picture is a committee member uh, painting some ground order repair with the white line. You may or may not always see the white line. It might just be uh, maybe a tire rut that's there. Maybe it's a, a pile of leaves and sticks and brush that is piled for removal. The superintendent uh, plans to get out of there within the, the next day or so. Immovable obstructions. I think we've all had our ball on a cart path or been standing on the path before. This could also be a sprinkler head, a sprinkler control box, something like that. Uh, and then the picture all the way to the right, some temporary water, which, you know, over the past month, I think it's rained in Richmond at least, uh, at least one day each week. So I'm sure there's still some, some temporary water someplace out there. Uh, but when you're going to take nearest point of complete relief, uh, there's a procedure that you, you should abide by, and it's not difficult. Um, you're going to estimate the point where the ball would lie, um, nearest to the, the ball's original spot, but not near the hole. Uh, it's re in the required area of the golf course. So if you're in the general area, like this person is, you're gonna remain in that general area. And where there's uh, no interference from the condition um, from which relief is being taken. So what that really means is, you know, the middle picture here, this person, where his ball lies. And he's certainly entitled to play that if he wants to. If he goes to the right, his heels have to be completely off that car path. And then if he goes to the left, he needs to move further away from the car path so that his area of intended swing no longer has any interference by that as well. But you can see it's kind of an equidistant arc here. He's not going in any near the hole, no matter which side of the path that he's on. So when you're estimating this, uh, you definitely need to identify the club that you're going to use to most likely make this shot the stance that you're going to take, the swing, and the line of play. So I feel like the player has certainly done this in each case here. And uh, if I were making the ruling here, I, I might say that the image on the right is where he's probably going to take his relief. Now, the nearest point of relief isn't always the nicest point, unfortunately. So this player right here is taking correct relief. His uh, feet are completely off the cart path, but unfortunately, with that being the nearest, it's not the nicest, and he is going to have to drop it within this mulch and bush tree area, whatever you want to call it, and uh, kind of take it from there. So it's not going to be the most ideal spot sometimes. Uh, you're going to get relief uh, when your ball is on, in or on an object, and on down here in the left-hand corner, you see that this ball lies on the immovable obstruction, this drain, or it could be a sprinkler sometimes. Uh, maybe you've got some physical interference with the, the object. And I, I think if you were to pan down this picture, uh, the player's ball or stance is on the cart path. 
Um, or maybe in the, the right-hand picture here, temporary water that's on the putting green may intervene on the line of play, but this would only be for the putting green. There's a few exceptions where relief would not be allowed. Your ball is in the penalty area. You can see this in the top right-hand picture, that yellow line right there is identifying the yellow penalty area. Uh, maybe there's an abnormal course condition that is out of bounds. Or as the, uh, the bottom picture here, it's clearly unreasonable to play the ball because something other than the abnormal course condition is around or because you're choosing a club, the type of stance, swing, or direction of play that's just completely unreasonable. And so you can see the player here has his ball underneath this, this plant, this bush, and he's really stretching out his right leg to try to get onto the car path to maybe prove to the guys in his group um, or the, the rules official standing nearby that he has interference and needs relief from that uh, car path. But I think if uh, Tim or I were around, he would not be getting that relief. Now, the thing I love about the book, because I'm a visual learner, are these pictures here that, that come right out of the book. Um, so here's a kind of a step-by-step -step procedure for both a abnormal course condition, you know, that ground under repair that we might see, or that immobile obstruction, that cart path that we're encountering, and how we should go about uh, giving ourselves relief from that. So uh, top image, the player needs to re determine the nearest point of relief, and figure out what that reference point is. Uh, in this case, that black dot right there, you put a T down, measure one club length, left or right, it cannot be any nearer the hole, and then you can go back one club length. And so it's nice to have that half circle shape there. It's a very large area to drop in, um, but you might not always have that. As you can see with the cart path relief down here, the player, uh, it's right-handed. You can kind of see that with his feet, the direction of play. And so this could be the nearest point of relief at P2 um, and then drop it within that, that pie-shaped area. Um, if that player was left-handed, maybe he's coming to the opposite side of the cart path, but not always. But I think that's a good visual on how you would take relief there. Any early questions about nearest point of relief no questions have come through yet okay cool let's go on to a vetted ball and something that i i think we're all going to encounter as we've had these you know sometimes softer conditions even though it's getting cold at night um i think there could be a misconception sometimes that your ball needs to break the soil and it needs to uh be below that the, the ground and have dirt on the ball in order for it to be embedded, but that's not always the case. And so you can see with a series of three pictures here, the top two are below the surface of the ground. And so a player would be entitled to relief from embedded ball there, but the bottom picture you would not. And so you are certainly more than welcome to mark the ball with a tee to pick it up carefully and you know, put your hand down in the grass there to see if it actually is below the surface of the ground. And if it is, there is a uh, relief procedure in a couple slides that we'll be able to show you. But the ball must be embedded in the general area. You're not going to get that embedded ball, um, you know, in the penalty area or in a bunker, even though we call it, you know, a fried egg lie. Um, but if the ball is embedded on the putting green, which I think we can probably see in the bottom picture, uh, you definitely need to mark the spot, uh, lift it, clean the ball, repair the damage caused by the ball's impact, and then replace the ball in its original spot. But if the ball's in the general area, this is the relief procedure, which is almost the same as what we just took with uh, the ground under repair. The reference point here is going to be right behind the ball. Put a T there. You measure one club length, which if we haven't gone over in the in last week's presentation, or if you aren't aware, it is the longest club in your bag. It is most likely a driver, but it's definitely not going to be the long. Uh, but you're measuring left to right, no near the hole, coming on back, uh, creating as much as that half circle as you can, and then uh, it must drop in the relief area and your ball must come to rest there as well. That was pretty quick for embedded ball. 
maybe that's just a good refresher for people. Are there any questions? No questions on embedded ball relief. Okay. All right, more free relief. Um, now we're gonna be moving an interfering object, uh, but really sometimes it's nothing more than a loosen pattern. And you might be wondering, what is that? It's really almost anything that's natural. Uh, you know, you think about your sticks, the leaves that have blown from the trees, sadly some dead animals or the waste, uh, or the clumps of compacted soil, which does include the aeration plug. So as you know, your clubs or the courses you're gonna play over the next two or three months, start making their aerification schedule. Uh, these are some things that you could encounter. And I know you're seeing the, the uh, spider web over there and believe it or not, down here on the fourth bolt, spider webs are loose impediments, even though they're attached to another object. Um, you know, various other things that maybe we're encountering right now, uh, sand and loose soil are not loose impediments. You might be thinking of the Rory McIlroy situation you know, five or six or seven years ago, whatever it was now, where he had a little brain fart and he thought the sand and loose soil that he was wiping away was on the green, which would have been cool, but he was actually wiping it off from the fringe. And so he did get penalized for that. Uh, new frost and water, also not loose impediments. Uh, but in the event that maybe some areas of the state have encountered snow or not have natural ice out there, um, they could be either loose impediments or the player could treat them as temporary water. Uh, but without penalty, the player can definitely remove loose impediments anywhere on or off the course. They do so in various ways. You know, I could get Tim to help me move it with his towel or his hat, and we could sit there and pick them up like, uh, like this player is doing. Uh, we could probably try to scoop them out of the way with our putter. Um, but usually you try to choose the quickest and most effective method. Um, if a player's removal of loose impediment does cause the ball to move, uh, the ball must be replaced on its original spot. And if you don't know it, you can estimate it. Um, I would think that potentially you would know uh, the spot, but in the event that something happens, maybe you can just estimate and get it back there. Um, if the move ball has been at rest anywhere, except on the putting green and in the teeing area. But if you're going to try to be careful like this guy here and you know move that rock or some of those uh, pine needles or the pine cone, uh, if the ball does move, you are gonna get penalized one stroke. So I would say just be as careful as possible. I remember in the, the US junior um, three or four years ago, I was refereeing a match and a player and his caddy were right down looking at the ball, probably as close or closer than this player is, and really nitpicking some of these uh, pine needles out of there. And his ball oscillated, which it never changed position. And he looked at me and I said he was fine. And at that point, I think he got a little nervous and just backed away from the ball and decided just to give it a good, good whack because he had to hit it through a pine cone. Any questions about any of that? Right, going back to a bedded ball, we had one come in um, just related to the ability to clean a ball that's been embedded. Uh, if you could maybe shed some light on when that would be allowed versus not. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I may not I may not go all the way back to the slide, but yes, you can certainly lift and clean the ball when you're taking relief from the embedded ball. Time, you know, that I think a lot of people would come into a situation where they would not have to clean it is Tim, if my ball interferes with yours and I just need to mark it, pick it up with two fingers, allow you to play, and then proceed to put my ball back. Great. Thanks, Ken. Um, another one that came through, um, if taking relief in the general area, can that be from the rough to the fairway? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, a good question. Uh, the rules really don't differentiate uh, between rough and fairway. So all of that is a uh, general area. The other areas, just to quickly touch on them, the teen area of the hole being played. So we're on hole number five. That only that teen area is um, a defined area. Bunkers, penalty areas, uh, the putting green of the hole we're playing. So only number five. We've got rules to cover hole number seven and eight and nine. Um, and then the rest of it is general area. 
All righty, I think that's all we have for questions on that section. Up to some movable obstruction. So we just talked about some natural objects. Now we'll talk about uh, more artificial objects. And any of these can be moved with reasonable effort without damaging the obstruction or the course. Uh, so quickly looking over here at this rake, um, you know, as long as we can move that, I don't know why we wouldn't. I mean, it looks like it's on a little bit of a slope there and that ball might move, but we'll talk about it in a little bit. Um, integral part of the course, so an integral object like uh, this out of bounds stake right here. So this boundary object, immovable obstructions like this cart path. Uh, we did have a question in the last session about the status of these penalty area stakes, and those are movable obstructions. Those do not have the same status as the out of bounds stakes, which are fixed. So uh, you can move the penalty area stakes. This person in the top right here is moving that ball washer. Uh, we can move the rake like we talked about before. Um, it can really do so in, in any way. So if this guy needed a little bit of a hand to move that ball washer, it wouldn't be a problem. We have another picture from the book. It's trying to uh, indicate that this player's ball is up against this rake. Player moves the rake. The ball moves down that slope. And what do we need to do? Well, there's not going to be any penalty for that. So, you know, this object, you got to think it's artificial. It's really not supposed to be there like the natural objects are. So um, we're not going to give you any sort of penalty for that. The ball must be replaced on its original spot. And if you did quite catch where it was uh, touching the course uh, when this rake was moved, then you can just uh, estimate as close as possible. Um, now, relief when the ball is in or on the movable obstruction anywhere on the course except on the putting green. In this case, this looks like it's a towel. Another picture from the book. As we saw back here, that ball is touching the course. It has a hook. The ball is not touching the course here. So we need to give it that hook. We need to keep the integrity of dropping the ball and the randomness of that drop. So since this ball is not touching the course, we are going to drop it in the general area. We're going to still proceed under our uh, relief area here. This reference point is made from estimating the spot from right under the ball. And we are going to drop it within that one club length area. Cannot be any nearer the hole. And it's a pretty generous area for what this object is. Now, the only time we're going to take a similar situation and kind of get a better situation out of it is if we're on that specially prepared area like the putting green. In this case, this player is not going to drop the ball like the person did before in the general area. Uh, since we're on the putting green, we're going to treat it a little bit differently. We're going to estimate the spot underneath that towel, and we're going to go ahead and place the ball. Any quick questions about movable obstructions? No questions there. Okay. To some penalty areas. All right. So we'll talk a lot about, you know, how rules used to be before 2019. Uh, but when talking about what a penalty area is, area is, I think it's pretty obvious what a majority of them are. They are filled with water, a lake, a sea, a pond, a surface drainage ditch. But a committee, like you can see up here in the top picture, is uh, determining that that wooded area or an area of high grass is just constantly getting balls into it. So in order to speed up play and keep things moving, they're going to paint that as penalty area. A lot of things in the penalty area, virtually everything that you can do in the general area. So there's really no special rules limiting how a player they play in a penalty area, you can already see that this person is picking up a loose impediment. It's okay to move those loose impediments and take a practice swing like maybe this player did. Uh, it's okay to ground your club or even touch water if your ball is near that pond. We're all aware that we have two colors of penalty areas. We have yellow, we have red. 
And if you play in a lot of BSGA competitions, I would say a majority of the penalty areas that we paint, we try to be uh, painting red to maybe give you a few more options. And so we're gonna talk about two options that are the same in yellow and in red. And then we're gonna talk about a third option that only applies to red. So stroking distance. For those that are a little confused of what that is, it's where you previously made a stroke. So it could be from the teen area here where you're allowed to come anywhere in the defined teen area and you are able to tee it. Uh, maybe it was back in the fairway or the bunker. Maybe you bladed a bunker shot and you need to come stroke in distance. In this case, we're dropping the ball. And I think in a more rare situation where the previous stroke was made from the putting green, you would place it, but uh, if that ever happens, definitely send us an email on that. I think we would love to hear the story. All right, back on the laundry. This is gonna be a tad different than what uh, a lot of us are used to, really gonna stress uh, dropping it on the line. So what it is, is I'm gonna pick my poison. I'm gonna pick my, my bread and butter shot, like this guy here, maybe it's 120 yards for me. I'm gonna connect the dots from the point where the ball last crossed the edge of the penalty area. And I'm gonna draw an imaginary line connecting that to the flag stick and come back until either I find a flat area or I find that yardage that I'm good with. Whatever your decision is, you have to make sure that you're dropping that ball on the line. I drop it off the line to the left or the right. That's not gonna determine this reference point and then that's not gonna determine this relief area. So I really wanna stress that because I don't wanna get y'all a two stroke penalty for playing from the wrong place. to jump the gun a little bit, but just want to reiterate the spot on the line where the ball first touches the ground when dropped. That creates the relief area, and it's one club length from there. And you can see, we thought they were, they were being generous before with a half circle shape, but they're really being generous now and allowing that ball to even jump forward as long as it has not exceeded that one club length. All right, so just can't be any nearer the hole then this spot where it last crossed the edge of the penalty area must be in the same area of the course. Uh, so he's got to remain in the general area. He's not going to draw a line back here and then drop it in a bunker. There's that third option that's only available under the red penalty area. He's going to estimate the spot where it last crossed the edge of the penalty area and he's going to measure two club lengths. He's got his driver in his hand. He's coming no near the hole. Might be a little difficult to determine since uh, we don't really know the direction of play. And he's going to drop it anywhere within this shaded area. So he doesn't necessarily have to come out to the, the edge of the two club lengths. Maybe where he's standing, it looks like a flatter area. Maybe it's got some better grass. So just you're entitled to the entire area here. You don't necessarily have to maximize it all. Here's a book from, or I'm sorry, a picture from the book again, kind of recapping our three options. So she's back here on the tee. She hits a little wayward shot. It crosses the penalty area at X here. She can either come back to where she previously hit in the teen area. She can find that point and come back in line with the flag as far as she wants to go. Again, for whatever reason, she wants to continue back back here off the screen, or she should, can go with uh, the lateral uh, penalty area relief and measure the two club lengths. And, you know, in my opinion, this might be the best option here because it looks like it's getting her out in the fairway and it's got a clean shot. So when you're taking this relief options, just kind of think about what is the course giving you and what's, what's going to be your best option to hit the, a better shot next time. Any questions about the penalty area? Yeah, we just had a good one come through. Um, when taking relief from a penalty area, does the player's stance have to be outside the penalty area um, after taking that relief? That's a good question. Um, actually, it, the stance does not. It's not the same as that um, immovable obstruction with the cart pad. So it's just a matter of 
where your ball lies. As long as your ball is outside the penalty area and still within that relief area, you're good to go. Um, another one that we could speak to um, just as, as we mark courses for events and championships throughout the summer, um, the reasons why a course might choose to mark something yellow versus red. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's a pretty good question. Yeah, I don't know that we'll go too deep into the weeds with that one, but you know, I, I think it was always thought that a red penalty area needed to kind of go parallel to you while you play the hole. Um, and that's not really the case. I think we're looking at a hole and if we can imagine a pond in front of a green and the green is sloped down, I think the design of the hole and the architect wanted us to negotiate this penalty area. So that screams yellow penalty area to me. We must successfully get over this pond in order to, to play the hole. And if we don't, maybe we have a drop zone to go to. But if that penalty area is maybe closer to the tee and there's a lot of open area, a lot of short grass down near the green, and it's not that sloped, I think we might paint it red. I mean, if a person trickles their ball off the tee into that penalty area, the likelihood that they're re-tee is probably like 99% anyways. I don't know why you would want to walk up to the edge of the penalty area and take your lane from there. So hopefully that helps explain it. Uh, one more come in, um, which we covered in the uh, in the earlier session as well. If you're not sure that your ball has entered the penalty area, can you play a provisional ball? That's a good question. Let's put that one on hold just for a little bit, because I think the question might be answered towards the end of the presentation. I don't want to jump the gun and maybe cause some confusion. So let's see if the slides can help answer that. I think we're good to keep moving then. Okay. Let's go to unplayable. All right, kind of an interesting thing here that the player is the only person who may decide to treat their ball as unplayable. So your caddy can't help you. I mean, they can, but you ultimately are the decision maker here. Uh, maybe it's your four ball partner. They might give some strong suggestions, but it's ultimately you. Uh, you can determine your ball is unplayable uh, anywhere on the course except a penalty area because we just had rules for that and there's a there's procedures for that so this is uh other places but we are going to have a lot of similar relief options with a few different like kind of tidbits here stroke and distance i think that's self-explanatory now that that's just back to your previous shot so you can see she hit an errant shot here it's in this group of trees or deep uh deep bushes I uh, she wants to just just drop another one. She's like, no, I'm just going to hit stroke and distance. Mm -hmm. uh, now, these next two options, I'm going to say that you have to. It is a must situation that you identify your golf ball because by no, option number one, she's just going back stroke and distance. But in order to determine these two club lengths for option number three or back in line with the flag for option two, we need to have a reference point. And so we need to figure out where our golf ball is. We need to use binoculars to see it in the tree, or we need to, you know, kind of identify it within that bush. All of these are under a one stroke penalty. All right, we do have a fun, maybe not so fun if you're not playing well, <laughs> uh, it's other option for a bunker. So all of these, options or option two and three you notice you have to stay within the bunker here option one obviously stroke and distance that's not necessarily in the bunker option two back in line with the flag must remain within the bunker for one stroke penalty option three two club links sadly you're not getting that whole second club link because of the lip of the bunker here but you get a majority of it still one stroke penalty and then for this additional option you can come out of the bunker, but this one's going to cost you two strokes. So just decide what you want to do based upon maybe you're not a good bunker player that day or at all. Uh, maybe you just think it's an easier shot. Whatever it is, you're entitled to do this under an unplayable ball. It's just going to cost you yet another stroke. So two strokes to get it out of the bunker.
questions there? None on unplayable ball. Okay. Stroke and distance relief, ball lost or out of bounds, provisional ball. So we might get to uh, the answer to that question. All right, when is a ball lost? It's not found within three minutes. After the player or their caddies begin to search for it. Um, it's not necessarily like when Tim or I, you know, a member of the committee, a rules official comes to search for it. It's when people are part of your side. So you, your caddy, your partner, your partner's caddy, um, when you all begin to look for the ball, that's when that clock's going to start. All right, when is a ball out of bounds? This is a good one. Uh, picture straight from the book. Uh, imagine that, you know, like there's this, this guillotine, if you will. If any part of the ball is touching the course, it is still in bounds. Uh, so some of these options that are in the gray area, clearly out of bounds. This one right here, it's kind of half in, half out. That's going to be good to go. Uh, this one, clearly in bounds. And then over here on the right-hand side, clearly out. And then you've got one that's on the line. So since it's not hanging over onto the course at all, it is still out of bounds, but then these two are still in bounds. Hopefully that picture helps make a lot of sense. That was always a, a tough visual for me. So if the ball is lost or out of bounds, a player must, and now you see it's underlined. There's some other words in the rule book that are like should, and those are more of a suggestion word, but a must, is a, a definite, you have to do this. So if your ball is lost or out of bounds, the player must take stroke and distance relief, which we just went over, you know, with penalty area and unplayable. So these options here should not be confusing to you. Uh, it is still one stroke penalty. You could be playing the original ball or another ball uh, from wherever that previous stroke was made. Now, this one right here, this has to be adopted by your golf course, uh, the competition you're playing in. Maybe it's even like the, the group that you're playing with that day. It's a model local rule. Um, it's going to provide a quicker option than maybe playing a, a provisional. So let's try to break it down. It is going to cost you two strokes. Uh, imagine that this hole right here, it has a lot of open area on either side of it. Maybe it's an, uh, other golf holes, but it's not out of bounds. So this player has hit an errant shot over here near the trees. It's uh, She's estimating where this spot is going to be. She is going to measure her two club lengths to the left here. And that's the furthest edge from her relief area. And then she's going to come out to the edge of the fairway, uh, which is... A fairway height, um, I think, is how the model local rule reads. And so that's her other reference point and measure two club lengths. And now she gets this entire shaded area, however far back she wants to go to take relief instead of hitting that provisional ball. Now, you can't be bouncing back and forth and hitting provisional ball sometimes and this model local rule other times. It needs to be something that you're adopting for the entire competition. Um, over here... On this right-hand picture, uh, the out-of-bounds is kind of dictating how far this player's uh, relief area can be over here, uh, but then it's finding the edge of the fairway with the two club lengths and then measuring that. So he clearly has a little bit of a smaller pie shape, uh, whereas she had kind of a larger one, just based upon how the hole was designed. Any questions about that? No questions on that section. Okay. Our last section here is about provision ball. So let's see if we can take our time and, and answer these. What is a provision ball? It's another ball played in case the ball just played by the player might be out of bounds or lost outside a penalty area. So that's kind of a key piece of information there that we're going to dive into in just a second. So you can play a provision ball in any of these situations. When your original ball went towards an out of bounds or might be out of bounds. So maybe, maybe it got hung up someplace. Um, when your original ball went somewhere on the course outside a penalty area where you don't think you'll find it. So 
You know there's a pond over there. You can see it, but it's surrounded by trees and high grass. That's an awesome time to hit a provisional. You don't know if that ball is in the water. You don't know if it's hung up in the high grass. You don't know if it hit a tree and bounced down or when your original ball might have come into a penalty area, but it also might be somewhere that you can't find it outside the penalty area. Kind of like the same thing that I, uh, I just suggested. Um, so in my last example, the time that you would not be able to hit a provisional ball is if you know there's a pond over there, but there's nothing but short grass. It's fairway height all the way down to the pond and your ball has a very likely opportunity to continue to roll and bounce and enter that penalty area. That'd be an instance where you're not allowed to competition. So announcing the play of a, a provisional, you don't necessarily have to say what this player is saying and, and announce that I'm playing under rule 18.3, but you certainly can. Uh, but you have to announce that you're going to play a provisional in some obvious way. And uh, you know, saying that you're going to reload or you're going to play another, those are options that are probably not going to uh, be okay under the rules. Um, as you can see, playing another ball, playing again, you need to try to use the word provisional uh, or otherwise clearly indicate that this is what you're doing, that you're just not, you know, proceeding under stroke and distance. Okay, so you're played the provisional, you're trying to figure out where the original is, uh, the player's allowed to search for the, allowed to play the provisional all the way up to where the estimated spot where the player's original ball is likely to be. So this player thinks he connected pretty good. It's out here like 250 yards, but it's in this group of trees or high grass. And he's like, you know what? I'm gonna play a provisional just in case, you know, of course, Provisional goes off the tee just like any other provisional would right down the middle of the fairway, but he doesn't catch it as good and it's about 200 yards. So he could step up to, to point A here and try to rip a three wood down here, but maybe he tops it and it doesn't quite get to this shaded area. He's still short of where the original, original ball is estimated to be. So he could that ball again and then make it onto the group. But the minute he was at point A and maybe advances the ball to point B, he can no longer come up to point B and hit that ball and expect to come back and find the original. That's not going to be cool. By him playing from anywhere in this shaded area, from a point that's closer to the hole than where the original ball is likely to be, he has made an action. Something has happened to cause that ball to now be lost and out of play. It could have been the three minute search. It could have been played from closer to the hole. Um, and those, these are situations where the provisional ball must be abandoned. So if the player finds the original ball in the course within the three minute, provisional ball has to be picked up. Player may play the original ball and proceed under the rules. Uh, the rules being that maybe he, he found that and he wants to proceed under unplayable ball. Our option two here, the player finds the ball in or on, or it's known or virtually certain that the ball is in a penalty area. So in my example before, where there's a bunch of short grass leading down a hill towards a, a pond, my ball has a great likelihood. I am virtually certain that the ball's in a penalty area. We can no longer play the provisional. We can't even play one, actually we have to proceed, proceed under the penalty here. Hopefully that's not too confusing, but hopefully I also answered that question previously. Any questions about provisional ball? Um, one just came through. If you played a provisional, but find your ball and it's unplayable, how do you proceed? So okay, so you, you found your ball and you want to proceed under option two or three. The back on the line or uh, the, the ladder. So you found your original and you had just go from there. That's your reference point. So the provisional uh, doesn't apply to you. You have to pick that up. But 
if you had hit that provisional and you did not find the original, well, now you can go and proceed with the provision because that's what it's there for, to help speed up play and basically proceed it under stroke and distance. Okay. Um, one more for uh, provisional ball related. What if the player rushes ahead to play their provisional ball in order to make it the ball in play, but someone finds the original ball after they hit that provisional? Okay. So, you know, I gave this example last time, and I'm not sure how many people remember the, the day of Phil Mickelson and the guy that I'm not remembering hitting a ball into a ravine or both their balls into a ravine. And uh, I think they each played provisional balls. They really didn't want the, uh, the spectators or maybe it was a volunteer try to find that ball. So if they ran up there, and played their provisional ball from a spot closer to the hole than, the, than where the original was likely to be, then that original would have been out of play. So they certainly could have run up there as fast as they could. Uh, but I believe in th that example, the volunteer found both those balls. They had to identify them at that time and then proceed from there. It's a good example. Anything else that we can answer? I think that's that covers that for provisionals. Okay. Well, actually, that was our our last section. Believe it or not, we kind of breeze through there. Uh, give you a heads up on next week's uh, schedule: finding and identifying a ball, playing the course as you find it, playing the ball as it lies, ball in motion deflected. So. I think a lot of good premises there of what uh, what the game of golf wants you to do and what the rules do. Um, take off, that's awesome. Tim and I are going to hang out, answer a few more questions for the next 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, definitely appreciate you all uh, being a part of this. And this is one related to match versus stroke play and how any of these rules might differ um, in those styles of play. Did you say, Tim? Yeah, um, just if there's any variations for the rules we covered um, in oh. match play versus stroke play and how they oh. applied. Yeah, um, I mean, just to do a quick review. No, I don't think that there is any variation from any of these. I think it just really comes down to uh, making sure that your opponent is not breaching any of these rules uh, and trying to take advantage of a situation. But everything that we've covered here should apply. Um, the only one that I can think of that would have any difference is someone just being able to recall a shot. Um, another one related to the provisional section. If you find your original ball and you've decided that it is unplayable, um, do you go back and hit a ball with stroke and distance um, and not use that provisional ball? That's that's correct. Yeah. Um, if yeah, it, well, no, no, no. I, I think I'm misunderstanding the question. So you you find your original ball, uh, but you've decided that it's unplayable. Do you go back and hit a ball with stroke and distance and not use the provisional ball? Um, no, no, you can still use the provisional ball because anytime that you have the ball in your hand, you would be able to substitute that ball anyways. I think 
um, to proceed under option two or three, you just have to have found that original. You need that reference point. Uh, and then stay on that same track of provisionals as well. If somebody does find your ball within three minutes and you decide to ignore that information and play your provisional ball anyway, would that be considered a wrong ball penalty? And what would be the result of that happening? No, I don't think that's going to be a wrong ball. Uh, I mean, you've, but you're still, you're underneath the unplayable. So it's still an option to play stroke and distance. I think, I think by the way to look at it like this is if your ball is found outside the three minutes, you are forced to go stroke and distance by finding your ball under three minutes, all three options on an unplayable are still alive to you. Rolling in now. Um... See if I can help. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to sort through these questions. No worries. See, uh, if your ball is on the cart path, you must take free relief from the point that is closest to the original ball, not closest to the cart path. Correct. Uh, you know, let me try to see if I can explain this. Your ball is on the cart path, and it is more favoring the right edge of the path. Um, maybe that's your nearest point of relief. And if you're going to choose to take relief, you need to take complete relief but it is not required. Uh, it is free, like you said, but you can certainly still play uh, the original ball sitting there. So it is whatever your the nearest point of relief is from the original ball. Um, on an out of on a ball that is determined to be out of bounds, mark the spot and play from the from next where it last crossed the OB line. No, that is incorrect. That uh, playing it from where it last crossed the edge of the penalty area only applies to penalty areas. It does not apply to out of bounds. Um, you're going stroke and distance for out of bounds unless that model local rule is. Um, is being adopted where in that case your your reference or I'm sorry your relief area is a pretty large shaded area you do get to come all the way out to the edge of the fairway with that um, but I'm not you're not necessarily just going up to where it last crossed the edge of the out of bounds and dropping it from there. Not sure about a rules interpretation, you should play a provisional and then decide. Uh, see it under the rules and at the ground, or do you play both balls and pull out? Uh, I think that's kind of a mix of two things here. Um, I think you should always play a provisional if you think your ball could be lost outside of a penalty area or out of bounds. But if while playing a hole, you think that you should be getting relief from a tire rut that is not marked, then you would announce that to the people in your group, uh, also to the committee, and you would play out the hole with both balls, you know, announcing uh, before you play which ball you want to count. Maybe you really think you should get relief with ball number two. That one where they that the local rule out of bounds. Yeah, why don't you sit there and look at that?
fall and it rolls into the rough, can't find it even though it should be right there. All this happens like that. Hmm. I have to go back and hit from the place of the previous shot with the stroke penalty. You can't just drop it near where you estimate you have a stroke. That is correct the way that you kind of describe it, but I think here on the screen could also help explain that because it doesn't necessarily need to be from the T like in the left picture. It could be out in the fairway like the right picture where your ball should be right here but or right here, but it's not. So you're going to estimate where it is and – Hopefully you have both sides, but maybe you don't. And you find the edge of the fairway and two club links and drop it anywhere within the shaded area. I think this one, you might've already answered Kent, but if someone else finds your ball within three minutes, You've already played your provisional ball. Can you choose which ball to play? The ball's already been found within three minutes, and you have to abandon the provisional. Hopefully that helps answer this other question, that if someone does find your original ball within those three minutes, and it is playable, but you decide to just keep playing the provisional, is it a wrong ball penalty? What would happen? Uh, yeah, I mean, if someone finds your original ball, you are required to go over there and identify it. Um, and if you decide to keep playing with your provisional, you have now hit a wrong ball because that provisional is no longer in play. Tim, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Um, if there's any other questions or people that are still on here and you're, you know, just trying to figure out how to phrase your question or maybe you're still confused a little bit about something, feel free to uh, send us an email and we will do our best to get to that as soon as possible. We'll probably try to send you uh, some graphics if we need to or uh, a link to um, the actual wording of the rule. So hopefully uh, we can help answer any questions that way, but we definitely appreciate you all being a part of this. And if next week is something that you're interested in, uh, feel free to tune in. We will also be doing two sessions then at 12 and at six. Thanks again. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody.